recording the session. Um, so let me review the agenda for today. Um, we're gonna start with the didactic presentation by Dr. Lisa Richardson with the CDC. Um, then Dr. Hotz, um, Ashley um, Hardeen and Rhonda Green will be doing the case presentation. Dr. Hotz is with AAPHC. Um, Ashley and Rhonda are with Horizons uh, Community Solutions. Um, we also have Dr. Lorianne um, Aldombro and Samia Ibrahim managing the controls. Um, now I'll introduce Dr. Doug Patton, who will take over today's session. Dr. Patton is a Dean of the Southwest Regional Campus uh, based in Albany for the Medical College of Georgia and has spent most of his career as a rural uh, physician. Doug? Thank you, Kush, uh, and all the others who've helped put this together. It's a, it's a great day. I'll just take a few minutes to kind of go over a few things so we can move to the next slide, please. Uh, this is our teleecho colorectal cancer screening uh, effort. Next slide, please. Uh, that's the agenda. Next slide. So just a reminder about ECHO, it stands for Extension for Community Healthcare Outcomes, and our motto is moving knowledge instead of people. Move that to the next slide, please. So this is the colorectal cancer screening uh, ECHO, and, and as he mentioned, this will be recorded. And you're considering to be recorded by staying on uh, as we move forward. Um, just as a reminder, this is not um, a, an environment for consultation, so please do not make any mention of any PHI in our discussions. Feel free to anonymize any, com any comments that you might make to share so that we can all learn from your experience. Questions um, during the presentations can be put into the chat if you have uh, Questions you don't want in the chat, you can email them to that address there. Next slide. So we use the data uh, from the registration and from the questions and from the surveys to help us learn. Everything that we do is intended to help us all learn from each other. Uh, can be used for reports, maps, communication surveys, quality assurance, evaluation research, and to inform new initiatives. And this is all centralized through the the uh, Project ECHO hub, this, the main hub, if you will, at University of New Mexico. Next slide. So just some general Zoom reminders. Uh, as we were discussing earlier with Dr. Richardson and I, we're all struggling a little bit remembering sometimes, but let's mute when we're not speaking, unmute when we do. Uh, we have the chat where you can enter questions at any point during the presentation. Uh, we ask that you reserve um, any interruptions, if you will, until the presentation is complete, but the chat's available anytime. Uh, use your camera if you can. We realize that some people have bandwidth issues and can't always use both. They can't stay in the meeting and use their camera. Uh, that's one of our real challenges here in Georgia, but use it when you can. Um, and if you use the gallery view, uh, which the settings for the viewer in the top right-hand corner, if you hover over that, you can see gallery view, and then when we're in presentation mode, if you pick side-by-side -side gallery, you'll be able to see whoever is speaking alongside the slides at any time. If you have questions or problems, you can put them in the chat to either Sama or Lorianne, um, and we'll be glad to respond to that. Um, so at this point, it is my pleasure. I think that's the last slide. Uh, oh, a reminder about the screening survey. Take a quick snap of that if you haven't completed the survey uh, or go into the chat and look for the link uh, to the survey uh, so that you can complete that screening survey. We'll give you give folks just a few seconds here to try and uh, get started on that, get that open. Um, we won't wait too long because we want to spend our time on the content and the discussion. But Take a look at that. It's important that we try and get as many uh, respondents to this as possible. Wait just a few seconds here to give folks a chance to catch up if they haven't done that. While you're doing that, I just wanna express my appreciation to everyone for attending and hanging in there with us. We, looks like we got about the same number of participants as we've had in our previous sessions. And that is an indicator that uh, you're devoted to learning about this process. And we hope that your participation will continue and that you'll help us keep making it engaging and interesting going forward. So at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and um, take my liberty to uh, 
introduce Dr. Lisa Richardson. It's an honor and privilege to introduce her. She serves as the director of the Division of Cancer Prevention and Control in the National Cancer Center of Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion at the CDC. She provides leadership and direction for all scientific, policy, and programmatic issues related to four national programs. That's the Colorado Cancer Control Program, the National Breast and Cervical Cancer Early Detection Program, the National Comprehensive Cancer Control Program, and the National Program of Cancer Registries. She oversees a well-developed research agenda that includes the National Cancer Prevention and Control Research Network and multiple areas of focus, including access to cancer care, systems of care, health-related quality of life during cancer treatment, health disparities in racial discrimination, and breast cancer treatment patterns of care. She's board certified in hematology and oncology. She's a Robert Wood Johnson clinical scholar and a member of the AOA Medical Honor Society. She continues to provide clinical services to patients at the Atlanta VA Medical Center as her schedule allows. She's a highly sought after expert on public health's role in cancer control and prevention, the role of healthcare delivery and cancer outcomes, health equity, and quality cancer care. Dr. Richardson's going to take about 20 minutes or so to give us an overview of CDC's colorectal cancer control program. During that time, if you have questions, please enter them into the chat. Afterwards, we'll review those questions that are in the chat, and we'll also have a few moments, hopefully, to answer any live questions that you have. A quick reminder, you can raise your hand virtually if you go to the reactions button on the bottom of the screen and look for the raise hand signal and we'll identify you and move forward. With that, Dr. Richardson, I'm gonna turn it over to you and thank you for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. So I gotta shorten that thing up. Every time I keep trying, they keep sending y'all something longer. <laughs> it's I'm okay, like, two, it's important. Two to three sentences is fine. But, um, and then the other correction is, um, one correction is the CRCCP is not, the colon cancer is not nationwide. So I've tried to fix that again. So it's, oh, okay. what is it now? You'll see the map later. We it's wishful thinking, right, Jim? So um, <laughs> exactly. Aspirational. So, oh, aspirational. I love that. So um, that is an aspirational goal. So next slide. So thinking about colorectal cancer screening, it's actually one of the, in my mind, one of the things that we've sort of coalesced around that everybody can agree is something good to do, um, you know, or it's something that's beneficial to others, and we can. Um, not argue about the benefit of it. And that what's, that's what makes it such a nice area to work in. Because in the middle, I learned this several years ago, evidence is now the medium of exchange, right? It's not things, it's not places, it's actually the evidence. And so we do have the evidence and the goal now is try to get it out into practice so that everybody can benefit. Next slide. So here's the latest information, um, 2019 is on our website on colon cancer. So we met the um, Healthy People 2020 target, um, way met it way back, what is that, 2012, right after it was released. And now we've moved on to the 2030, um, but I think we're still making good progress. And this is the latest data. 2020 is available, but we did, didn't have a chance to update this. Next slide. So, you know, it is still the second leading cause of death among men and women, um, and it doesn't have to be that way. Next slide. So 90% of these, you know, are treatable um, and people live more than five years if we find them early. Next slide. But the more important thing to me, and this seems to be, I don't know why this is, isn't what we always lead with, but if you remove polyps, you prevent cancer. And that's really the power of colon cancer screening, as well as um, cervical cancer screening. If you find the pre-lesion, remove it, the cancer never happens. Um, and so this is really what I'm trying to change the language around at CDC is that colon cancer screening is really a wellness test. It's not a disease test. Most people have polyps or nothing. They don't have cancer. Um, next slide. And just the last point on that, the previous slide was that the I'm trying to figure these things out too, is that once you have symptoms, the test is no longer screening, it's diagnostic, right? And so there's still confusion among the general public. I just did a radio, um, a bunch of interviews for radio where that was really one of the things I emphasize is that it's without symptoms because once you have symptoms, there's a problem. 
Um, and we have to go find you know, what the problem is. Next slide. So just to remind everybody, the USPSTF in 2021, um, this one took almost a year to finalize, but in any case, A and B services, as you know, are covered under the Affordable Care Act um, or supposed to be covered with no copay um, for most with people with insurance. A lot of the people you all see don't have insurance and that's where the, this program that um, CDC manages comes into play. And even for adults over 75, it really depends on your screening history. I mean, if you're 75 and you've never been screened for colorectal cancer, and you don't have a bunch of comorbid conditions, it's probably a good thing to do. So you really do have to um, use your brain as a provider um, to sort of figure out who needs what. But when you're looking at this A and B is usually for a level of evidence and then um, the Affordable Care Act, who, who pays? Next slide. So these are the screening tests from the last revision of the uh, US Preventive Services um, Task Force recommendations. So I'm not going to read all these to you. You guys know because you're out there doing the work. Um, I was a little bit surprised at the last, well, the flexible sigmoidoscopy. I don't know what you guys do out there in rural areas that may be used more and you can inform me, but it's almost you know microscopically used when we look at the data that CDC collects. Very few um, patients or people in the community are reporting that they're receiving um, sigmoidoscopy. We are in the process of doing a, a medical claims um, a medical claims study where we're looking at that. And there was not an insignificant number of flexible sigmoidoscopy claims in that data. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, what's happened over the last five, you know, five to 10 years. Um, next slide. So these are the latest data that we um, published on our website. There's gonna be a little um, squiggly embarrassment here for me as we move through this little part of the thing. Uh, numbers are up all over the place and they're different. So I'll explain some of that. But this is BRFSS using the USPSTF recommendations from the last cycle, because these were released in 2021. I wouldn't expect to see any changes in self-report till about this year next year or the year after. So the data always lag when we're looking at how we ask the questions. And uptake is also an issue. Um, now it's 45 and under. So our plan at CDC is to calculate the 45 number, starting at 45 and then collect the, you know, um, calculate the 50 number, 50 plus, so that we can compare historically. But there are a lot more people that need to be screened now that the 45 number, you know, the age has fallen to 45 or dropped to 45. Next slide. So this is a paper we just published at um, in Preventing Chronic Disease um, in April, looking at what the up-to-date is within um, by state. And the bigger, um, the bigger push in that paper was who has not been screened at all. So um, not really showing much of that data, but I think we never talk about the never screened in colorectal cancer. We talk about it some in cervical cancer. Very few women have never had a cervical cancer screening test. But when we look at colorectal cancer, it's over 20% of people have never had a test of any type. So I think for me, if we're gonna try to catch up or try to get ahead of you know, colon cancer screening, that's the population that we have to go after. Um, it's about 8% who are screened and not up to date, and then everyone else is up to date per self-report. Um, as you know, BRFSS, we don't go and verify that the information is actually accurate. So it's what people tell us. Next slide. So we do have fact sheets for, you know, different for, um, for every state that we provide to our programs, and this is on our website. So again, you'll notice that there's some different small differences in the numbers. This is in 20, um, 2018. I just showed you 2019 data. One thing we have noticed, and you guys have probably noticed it as well, is that everything is sort of plateaued at the, um, the high 60s, the mid to high 60s. And we're really having a hard time you know, pushing past that. Um, the 80% in every community, we're still you know, working really hard on that with the colorectal cancer roundtable, ACS and ACS CAN. But I think, you know, we've, we're reaching a plateau with colorectal cancer screening. And really to make these numbers, you know, go higher, we're going to have to go after the never screened people. Next slide. 
So why do people tell us that they're not getting, you know, not taking advantage of colorectal cancer screening? A lot of it is fear of what is what it's going to be like. Um, logistics, you know, is there someone to do a colonoscopy? As you know now, with the we are more well, we've always recommended, you know, blood stool test, um, but it's now becoming something more accepted for all providers to provide that. Um, finances, finances aren't really that big of a deal with the, um, the colorectal cancer fit test or other blood stool tests, but it really is becomes more of an issue if you're uninsured and you need to have a colonoscopy. You know, that some of the, some of these barriers have been removed in the last couple of years with, you know, the colonoscopy being covered by private insurance, but Medicare is still lagging behind. Um, and that's a Medicare social security act issue when we look into the details. And, you know, the last one is people just don't think they need it. Um, you know, why would I need to go get that done? Um, and so they don't get it done. And I think it's incumbent upon us to explain uh, the importance of, um, <clears throat> excuse me, colon cancer screening prevention. Next slide. So what happened in COVID? Can't go through anything without mentioning it at least once. I think this is the only time. So, um, but during this COVID pandemic in the last couple of, couple of years, um, we are still, the most current data I could find was October, 2021. I think the biggest issue for me within this, and you all, you probably agree, is the people, we're back up to the volume, almost back up to the volume that we had, but these are not, this is not prevalence of screening. This is volume of test. So there is a big, I think still millions of, millions of people backlogged, plus the 40, 45 to 49 who have now entered eligibility. And this is gonna be a huge number of people trying to catch up and get to the right place. But as you see the you know, cervical cancer is the one that lags the most, um, but this is one data set looking at you know, claims data for this data set. So if you, you know, expand it to the whole population, we asked some estimates out there, it's about 10 to 12 million people who didn't get screened. So it's really that area on, you know, area above the curve that we have to catch up and we're, we're nowhere near that. Next slide. So what is the colon cancer control program? You guys are grantees um, of the program, but when we, when we did our last version of the colon cancer control program, what we really looked at was go, moving from a providing a service one-on-one, -on -one, one person at a time, to looking at how do we change health systems to put these things in place so that um, everybody would have an opportunity to have that question asked and to get their screening. And so we think, you know, well, I think it's been a great success and I'll show you some data, but really it's about integrating public health and primary care, focusing on defined high need populations and, you know, using, and for me, the biggest thing here is using data to improve performance of the program, to not just collecting it to collect it. And all the other things too are um, extremely important. Next slide. So these are the evidence-based interventions. These are from the community guide, um, as well as supporting activities. We found that everybody likes to do small media, um, which is not at currently evidence-based, but um, I think it's totally necessary because you have to have materials to share with people. Um, to get out there. Larger campaigns, you know, we do Screen for Life. Um, we, I cannot think of a, I don't know, other than the TIPS campaign where they did this in-depth, very expensive evaluation that showed that TIPS actually worked. I don't think I've seen any other, and we haven't done it either, um, figuring out did the stuff we put out there for Screen for Life, a larger media campaign, make any, have anyone go say, you know, my doctor, I need to have a scan, I mean, a scan colonoscopy. We, it's just very difficult to do and extremely expensive to get it right. But I think we've made progress. I'll show you some of that. Next slide. So this is our current uh, colorectal cancer control program. You guys are, are uh, funded through the Georgia core, I believe. And so um, these are the, you'll see the color coding and you'll, you can have these slides when I'm done as well. Um, where they are. I saw on the list of participants, so there's a ton of people here from all over the country. Um, so, and probably from some of our funded states, but this is really um, the, the current program. As you see, it's not, it's not nationwide. So that's actually one of the things that we've been asked about. And of course, you know, if, what is it, the field of dreams? If you build it, they will come. If you send it, we will fund it. How's that? <laughs> all right, next slide. 
So here's the reach of the program for the five previous years. Um, you notice the, the um, 836 clinics from 264 health systems, um, 60, you know, 6,400 providers and 1.3 million age eligible people uh, were reached through the program that we had previously. And we are collecting this data this go around to see the impact on um, this time. Next slide. So this one is a tricky one to explain. So let me see if I can explain it. But to me, it's sort of, if you read the community guide, they tell you that multiple interventions work better than one at a time. Can be difficult to get that done. So when you look at the, let's say zero, so at the beginning of the program, the zero had all four community guide interventions already implemented in their clinic. So if you notice, if you look across, it actually with all four already has the highest at, you know, highest number of people being screened, 40, 42, 44%. And if you go all the way over to the four, so this is where you really see the impact of, you know, the multi-level interventions. If clinics implemented all four um, recommendations from the community guide, the clinic average screening percent went up from 18.3 to 51%. So going to the places where the need is the greatest and implementing things systematically had the biggest effect. Um, I can tell you, if I asked them to explain this 33 number to me a thousand times, because I'm like, I don't believe it. So, you know, we've, I've been back and forth with the team, with the data, but if there was nothing in place, you'll see for the light blue had the lowest percentage of people. But I think it's a program impact. I don't know, you guys can tell me what you think, but even in the places that already had four interventions already implemented, we're still seeing about 8% increase in screening in those clinics. Could be due to us, could do, be just background improvement. Um, but in any case, everybody got better. But the biggest improvement was from no, no interventions in place to four interventions in place. And part of our evaluation was really to see how many is the sweet spot, right? How many do you need to do to get to where you want to be? And as you see, we're still not, you know, anywhere near the 80% that we want, but getting there. And this is a weighted average based on, you know, multiple factors in the community, the clinic, the clinic size, all that stuff. So this is a, a corrected number. Next slide. So these are the things that everybody always told us worked and we actually evaluated and they do work. And there's the manuscript that we wrote um, to prove that, but more interventions is better than fewer. Um, how do you enhance the ones you already have based on what's in place already? Um, clinics with the lower um, screening rates and having a champion in the clinic. Someone like a Dr. Hotz who is you know, pushing this and making sure that the resources are available um, to make this happen. And that's how you end up with the best outcomes. So this is proof of what everybody told us um, should be working. Next slide. So I'm not gonna belabor this because we got, if you go to these two web links at the bottom, you can see the success stories. So what our clinics do is they send us in stories of how they got from A to B and what were the things that they put in place. So here, for example, the California, a neighborhood healthcare um, clinic in California implemented provider reminders. Everybody in the clinic was trained to provide, you know, the kits, the recommend the free kits to the patients. Um, LabCorp provided free kits and postage to return. Um, and their clinic, you know, their clinic level screening percentage went from 46 to 62. Um, don't know what they did to get that 61.2% um, return rate on the kits. I don't know what you guys get, but the literature says it's a lot lower. Um, but they did something there and we need to go back and do a little bit more um, work with that. And then the second one is from Virginia. Um, just looking at, I don't think they had anything in place and they went from 26 to 63 options used in the clinics. And it's a very small clinic. So small numbers, because they had 66 people screened that got their rate up to 63%. But um, I think what I, what I get from this is that people are very um, innovative out there and you know your community, you know your clinic, you know your resources, and you're the expert on getting things, getting things done. Next slide. I think I'm getting close to, oh, close to the end. So this is actually one of the, um, 
the return on investment for this particular project was is like a gajillion dollars. So I think you were at this this um, gym. This was our Mail Fit Summit that we did. And so um, Gloria Cronado, she's a researcher out in Oregon who does a lot of, you know, on the ground trying to figure out how to make this stuff easier. Um, and she was one of the participants. So we took her guide. Um, we took the results from the Mail Fit Summit that we did and we tricked out her guide that she already had to put all that information in there that we learned from that summit to say, hey, this is a how-to guide for implementing Mail Fit and this just was finished um, this spring. Um, the good news is, so one of the things I, I think we need to do at CDC and do more frequently is what are successes? How do you package? And then how do you scale to other things, right? So we know we've, we've done this at CDC. We've now packaged, it's available for everybody. But the latest success is that the Veterans Hospital Administration is going to take this guide and um, trick it out for the VA and make it available to all the VAs uh, and VA systems in the country. So for me, this is like, from this colon cancer work that we've done, this I think might be one of the you know bigger successes because this guy that I think that meeting was forty thousand dollars, <laughs> and uh, we just paid for people's travel to get there, and this is what we got out of it. So again, leveraging what you have, it doesn't take a whole bunch, but it does take you know just enough to get things done or get things started, um, and you get people's attention, and then that's a way to push things forward. Uh, next slide. And that's all I have. I don't know how much time that took, uh, but I'm happy to take questions from people, comments, suggestions on how to do it better, um, and anything you want to know. My email address if, you know, is lrichardson at cdc.gov. So if you ever have any questions, um, I'm happy to you know, talk to you. Um, Dr. Patton, I'm done. Thank you, Dr. Richardson. That was very helpful. It was a, it's a lot of information in a very short period of time with some great graphics. Uh, we did have one comment there. I just want to mention that uh, Terry Wood mentioned that they were already trying to figure out how to focus on the never screened population uh, and a real focused effort on that. You mentioned that earlier as one of the greatest mm -hmm. opportunities and also one of the biggest challenges. Yep. Uh, so I don't know if you have any special insight to share with Ms. Wood. So. Well, I, well, the, the, for me, the, to just move the conversation from up to date to never screen is huge, right? And so we wrote that paper four or five years ago, got no traction at all. So I was like, hmm, why don't we try that again and see if, you know, we can try it again and see if we can get some traction. I don't ever give up either. That's another, you know, character trait I have um, is not to give up. And so try again. And that's what we did. And so maybe this time we'll get a little bit more because I'm just telling you that 45 to 49 is going to be a huge lift. And 99% of them have never been screened, right? So if we can figure something out, um, that would be good. Also, Dr. Hotz, yeah. Yeah, Dr. Hotz has got his hand up. Yes, sir. You're muted. You're muted, Jim. I'm getting off mute now. Great presentation as usual. Um, one of those big barriers, uh, and I chair the Community Health Committee for the National Roundtable, is positive fit to colonoscopy. Um, what percent, and sometimes, you know, especially in a red state that doesn't pay, you know, have insurance, you know, it's a big problem. What percentage of positive fits in community health centers actually end up getting a colonoscopy? Do you know that number? I don't know that number, but we might be able to uh, figure something out for you. Um, I think so based on, you know, feedback from the last cycle, you know, you guys know that we do provide, you can ask for a certain amount of your CRCCP funding to do follow-up colonoscopy. So we, we did hear you. <laughs> and um, so, but no, I don't know that answer, Jim, but I'm happy to look into it. We may actually have some data here to look into it. And I've seen it reported as being less than 50% numerous places. Some of it may be anecdotal. I know Dr. Robert Smith has mentioned that he doesn't consider a complete screening until you right. actually have a colonoscopy and that 
um, you know, nationally, there are systems that are below 50%. So I just so, wanted people to know that, that that's always out there is one of those great challenges. Yeah, so Jim, the, the, the biggest challenge, though, is it's not just community health centers, you guys are doing just as well as everybody else. Um, if you look at some of the private systems, I mean, what's the best one in the country It's probably Kaiser, California. Um, they're about 80, 85%. So they're still missing 20% moving on from an abnormal test to a colonoscopy. So I think this is more of a systemic problem of our healthcare system, uh, an insurance, but even people with insurance are falling through the cracks on some of this stuff. But um, I think we did something in the last where we were screening, you know, we were, sc everybody was getting screened that I'll, I'll dig it up and see if I can share it to you. Okay, okay appreciate Share it that. with you, okay. Or with the group here as a group. But yeah, that's a huge problem, huge problem. Well, thanks for, for bringing that up. Uh, we do have a couple of uh, comments. Uh, one was a question about the slides being available, and of course they yes. will, as the entire recording will be. But another one is from Victoria from Iowa, from, from their project out there. She's wanting to know, can the mailed fit information, the packets and things like that, be customized with clinic logos? Um, hmm. If, yeah, I see no reason why that can't be done. So the answer is yes. You just have to have the ability to, to do that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Have the resources to make it happen. One thing that we, we do that we did a project way long time ago that's still going is something called Make It Your Own. It's called miyo.org, I believe, or .com. I can't remember. But Make It Your Own is where you can go and create your own small media based on your populations, where you are, the language you like to use. The, and there's a lot of, I think they've upgraded it quite a bit to use quite a few foreign languages, not just English and Spanish. And Dr. Coronado actually presented last month. Uh, so we've had a, a murderer's row as far as great presenters, <laughs> this yeah. which started. But I think her website, actually, she mentions the ability to customize and do yeah. some other things like that video stuff. So you know, we can go back to last month's um, ECHO project and um, Dr. Coronado's, Coronado's site. So what we're trying to, thanks for saying that, um, Jim. So what we're doing with the mail, that mailfit.org um, website that's on that last slide, that's actually goes to Gloria Coronado's website as well. And you can download. We're trying to figure out how to get all the CDC isms um, pass so we can post it on our website, but it is available. And that address is at the bottom of that last slide. Okay. Yeah, and you can go there and find all of her stuff, but she was very gracious and let us, um, the government, take her document and, you know, modify it for, for the general public. So that was very nice. Laurieann, if you'll back up one slide so the participants can see that information. Yeah, one, one more. Yeah, there it is, melfit.org. Melfit.org, and I also put a direct link to that implementation guide in the chat. If it's and those there. of you who work in VAs, it's going to be modified for the VA health system as well. Um, Jason Dominitz was very you know, passionate about that, and that probably be out by the end of the summer if you work at the VAs. It's going to be sort of customized to veterans. It's a that link is a PDF file. And if you have people who know how to work with PDFs, you can probably customize that by putting your logo on the bottom there. Yeah. Um, one, one comment from uh, Miss Wood that I thought was uh, interesting about follow-up scope success. She mentioned that they're about 80% successful with their Medicaid population, but the private systems and insurance are the ones who are having lower numbers of success. Absolutely, yep. Um, well, that's because you're probably, so the thing I think like with our breast and cervical cancer program, where we have a lot more, um, a lot more experience with the follow-up part, once you're in the system with some people like you guys, y'all don't let people go. <laughs> My doctor never calls me about anything. Okay. Um, and that's why I think, you know, when, when people are talking about where you get your health care, health systems, I think some of the best care occurs in the FQHCs and those FQHC like you know, like clinics, because you care and you follow up on people. And it's not just, you know, well, I shouldn't say it's not just a job, right? Sometimes That's it's just true. a job. <laughs> That's part, that is part of the culture and part of the mission, obviously, of the community health centers. Well, thank you, Dr. Richardson, for that. We're going to move on to our uh, case presentation, if you will. And at this time, it's, it's uh, my pleasure to reintroduce again, Dr. Jim Hotz, who's been here with us each and every time. 
uh, and contributing questions and insights all along, along with Ashley Herodin and Rhonda Green from Horizons Community Solutions. And they're gonna present a case study about their own experience with patient navigation. One of the, the most powerful evidence-based interventions that I know of. We've got about 10 minutes for that and then we'll have some time for questions after that. So continue to put questions in the chat if you have them for Dr. Richardson uh, or for uh, Dr. Hotz, Ashley or Rhonda as I present. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Hotz. Okay, we know that the removal of barriers is extraordinarily important, but who removes the barriers? Um, so navigators can do that. It's a tool to do. Um, Harold Freeman graduated from Sloan Kettering in 1968, the year I got out of high school. He then went to, um, he then took charge of a breast cancer um, surgical program, but he said, I wanna cut the cancer out of Harlem but my knife is not sharp enough. I can't do it. And when he took a hard look at the impact of, um, of poverty, racism, and other barriers that people had, you know, what he figured out, he needed to find somebody who could help people overcome the barriers. So he was the first person to publish on barriers. He was the first person to show that navigation worked. In the journal Marin College of Surgery, he showed that before navigation in Harlem Hospital, 6% of cancers in black women early stage, 41% survived five years. In the institution of this, the um, early stage um, cancers went up to uh, 41% and survival went up to 72%. So health inequity exists when you have highly effective technology that's not evenly distributed. So one of the things we recognized early on um, you know, is that we needed to find some way to use this navigator concept. So when um, tobacco settlement dollars went in and regional cancer coalitions were established, one of the things we did is employ a navigation system in, at that time we were just doing colonoscopies, and um, we actually took a hard look at this, did an evidence-based review, had one of the medical students from Augusta U um, Alex Bruder, who actually went into all of our charts and looked at what happens when we take a navigator from, um, uh, from Horizons and apply it to our patients getting colonoscopy. And the conclusion, and this is in the CDC and was published in Cancer in 2013, five, five times as likely to get a colonoscopy, um, five times as likely to complete it with um, good bowel prep, and we were getting over 90% people show up. And these are poor rural black folks in South Georgia. So what we do know is that um, you can navigate. Um, we know it can address barriers. Um, and uh, just recently, um, we've started navigating our fit tests back. Um, and uh, we went from a 30% return rate to 70 to 80%. We did a couple PDSA cycles looking at that. So what we do know is that navigation works. If you look like the Kohler Guard, they have built-in navigation that doesn't work really any better than what we have here and costs over $500. So what we have found out and what you see, you have to have a champion. Nothing frustrates your champion more than to order a test, tell the patient to do it, and the fit test is never returned. And one of the things that Robbie Amin is doing, our clinical liaison, is he's going through all the challenges of making certain the test is given to him, it's mailed back and it's returned and the navigators help get it in. So um, what, you know, what we can see from this process is that um, you have to have a well-oiled machine. Um, and one of the big barriers also is, you know, having somebody to pay for the colonoscopy and treating afterwards. So we actually have a mechanism uh, through the CDC grant dollars and also a partner organization, Phoebe Putney, which provides us 500 free colonoscopies and also access to their um, COC hospital to treat afterwards. So, you know, those are kind of the structural barriers. Once you've knocked down, knocked down the barriers, then you have to have a navigator and a system of navigation to work it through. So I'm gonna turn it over to the people who actually do the navigation. Um, I'm just telling you it works. 
it's there available. And what we're trying to do, our goal is to have a statewide navigation system um, based on the template that we've developed down here. Um, so it's evidence-based, it works, and I'm gonna turn this over to our navigators to pick it up. Do you have the case presentation? Okay, we got Ashley or Rhonda ready. Okay, hi, we're ready. Um, just wanted to briefly go over just some um, of the statistics that Dr. Hotz was talking about with um, the return rates, the show rates, the prep rates um, that we have for the quality of the preps. And this is just based on a previous fiscal year of last year during COVID, um, which has, um, kind of put some barriers in our way as well um, with the postal service and just getting patients back into the clinics and, and getting back in the routine of getting back into the screening um, mentality. Um, our uh, rates for colonoscopy show rates uh, we are at nine, well, we were at, uh, we're higher now, 94% uh, show rates for our colonoscopy appointments for our patients, um, which is very good. And that's all due to um, the navigators breaking down those barriers with transportation, reminders, education, um, you know, just continuously walking through that whole process with that patient so that we do have that great 94% show rate. Our bow prep from fair to good is 91%, which means a lot to our, our GIs. Um, they like to see a well-prepped patient um, come through, so that cuts down on their return time. They don't have to um, come back as as early because of possible missed polyps. Um, our suboptimal to poor prep is at 9%. Our fit return rate um, is 69, 70% of, of returning those fit kits. And, and as I said, that is, that's taking in consideration uh, COVID and postage and, and we have our insured kits are going all the way to Birmingham. And that has tended to make some problems. Some kits are getting lost and, and things like that. Um, but still, you know, 70% is, is pretty good considering the barriers that, the new barriers that we have, but we are breaking those down and uh, we expect to have higher rate this fiscal year. Um, Ashley's gonna go over uh, some information with you all about our processing and um, what our navigators do uh, and why it's important to have these referrals in this process. So some of the things that the navigators do is like with colonoscopies, we call the patients at every step of the process. So we get to remind the patients when to stop eating certain foods and we call them the night before to make sure that everything's going well. So that helps to make sure that that patient's gonna show up for that colonoscopy. We even call them the morning of to make sure that everything went well and that they're gonna show up for that colonoscopy. We make sure that if a patient was given a kit at the clinic, that the kit makes it to their house. You'd be surprised how many leave them on the bus or in the car. And we, if that happens, we can make sure that those get replaced. And so that that rate gets to be increased by making sure that they get a new kit. We also make sure that um, if they make a mistake with their kit, that we can get those replaced for them as well. Uh, we also work with making sure that the recalls get back to the physician at a, in a timely process so that y'all are aware of when they're due again and that a pa when a patient's due that, that they aren't sent ahead of time or that they're not given a kit when they're due for a colonoscopy so that they get the correct screening as well. Any questions that you may have about our processes or um, 
the the reason for the referrals the reason for the referrals especially in the um in your electronic systems is so that the providers and the staff uh, can see in real time the progress with the referrals so you know what we are we are uh, doing with that patient day by day contact by contact so um, there's not really much of a question. You can easily go into that referral, track where we are with that patient, track um, what the patient has uh, been doing with that uh, fit kit or with their colonoscopy, any follow-ups needed, any recalls, that kind of thing. So it's, it's a great tracker of um, the process of you know, a colonoscopy or a, a fit um, and especially when you're dealing with insured patients because you also have your consultations and your follow-ups so um, it's kind of a long process when you you're dealing more with a insured patient so that referral is definitely needed and helpful on both sides of of the process and, and two items that i think would be of interest to folks um, First one is um, we have looked at how do you make the referral as click free as possible. In fact, um, our team and, and Dr. Amina is going up to uh, the uh, ASCO, the American side of clinical oncology and presenting on reducing click burden on ordering things. So instead of 76 clicks, he's got it down to six clicks by using order sets. And I think everybody in who's a participant in this is can use that because um, they're all ECW based. Um, the other thing is uh, we also help with the uh, bowel prep. What do we do if somebody has no insurance and needs a bowel prep? What we do is uh, for our program, we provide that bowel prep to the patient along with the education that goes with that. Um, so we walk them through, we make sure that they have it in hand they understand when they're supposed to do certain things with their diet. We do the, um, the, they not only have the instructions, but we also do the reminder calls as well so that we are, um, we're in constant contact with them. And um, we do provide, just with our program, we provide probably about three to four uh, different types of bowel preps. Um, so there, there's not just one general prep. Uh, we, we do see that the preps are changing um, year by year. So we're trying to keep up with the, the GIs, but that takes a burden off the patient as well. They're not just, um, they, the bowel prep can be expensive, but it also, it's trying to get to the pharmacy and pick up that bowel prep too. So they can, if they're able to pick it up here, we let them pick it up here, we go over it with them. But if not, we mail their preps to them. So there's, there's a lot of barriers that we're cutting down with that bowel prep. And a valuable insight for anybody on the call is that this is being done telephonically from one end of the state to the next. Um, so what we found is that, you know, the navigators can actually work using that format. So our navigation hub working with our um, Horizons, which is our local cancer coalition, is actually navigating, you know, over 150 miles away. So just another thing about navigation, there's a scalability to it that if, you know, I know um, our CDC director who's on Dr. Richardson, what she's interested in, what have we learned that can, you know, be scalable and maybe reach a whole state. So, you know, that is, I think one of the things we learned is that you can telephonically navigate very effectively. So we do have one question, which was in the chat, but I wanna ask our partner from uh, the key, the key partner here from Georgia Core to ask her question out loud. Dr. Gibran, if you have that question. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, this kind of goes back to Dr. Richardson's presentation on that one slide that showed the EBIs and then the supporting interventions. I mean, we have evidence that this navigation works. The case study and the stories the navigator shared with us. I came from the Grady Health System where Otis Brawley hired lay patient navigators for um, breast screening and mammography, and we made a huge difference with stage shift as well. 
So when are we going to really, you know, require that, you know, navigation be part of the programs and, you know, part of an evidence-based intervention rather than just a supporting activity? So I put that in the, I put that in the chat. Uh, the community guide has um, labeled patient, one-on-one, -on -one, whatever you want to call it, community health worker, patient navigation is now considered evidence-based. So um, I'll pull that up and send you guys the link, but that was last year or year before last. So just haven't been talking about it a lot, but it's no longer a supporting activity. So they finally had enough evidence from people like, you know, what Jim just described, paper that they had in cancer to show that it works. So I'll find that and send it to you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Great question and great observation and a great setup for that, Dr. Richardson, by, by leaving it hanging out there in that column. Um, so um, any, we, Dr. Desai, looks like we have a uh, hand raised. Do you have a question for us? Uh, I just have a quick um, kind of comment and, and a, a request for discussion. Um, so we, we saw the you know, clear data um, about the benefit of navigation. We have some clinics that are part of this call that have been doing navigation for a long time and some that have uh, just started doing navigation that, that are um, newly part of the grant. Um, just a question for providers that have maybe, uh, that are newer to navigation, um, maybe somebody in um, East Georgia, um, have y'all noticed um, barriers to actually getting patients navigated or, or, or have y'all seen successes so far? I know you guys are a few months into this. Um, as far as getting, um, as far as uh, utilizing navigation. So maybe uh, Dr. Sheldon or, or Kyle or Coy or somebody from uh, East Georgia. Anybody out there from East Georgia want to take a shot? Uh, at that? I'm not the provider by no means, but I do look at the notes a good bit and I noticed, um, and I think this is the issue across the board is phone numbers disconnected. Yep. Um, they send letters and I do know when they send letters, a lot of times the patients will then send the kit back in. Um, so that does help. But I think one of our biggest issues with navigation is actually getting a hold of the patient to navigate them. So. That's uh, I think, been a challenge that a lot of people have experienced. Uh, um, yeah, I'll, I'll take you back on that as well. Just uh, oh, Dr. Sheldon here, and thank you, Sable. Um, that's definitely an issue, um, and and just the patients forgetting. I mean, I'll see them the next visit, and we'll say, "Well, did you you know remember to do your uh, uh, um, hemisure and?" Uh, they'll smile, be a little bit guilty and say, well, we'll, we'll get it next time. So um, uh, the, people just forget. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Sheldon. Uh, Dr. Islam, you have your hand up. I think we got time for a quick comment before we got to wrap up. Yeah, I have a quick comment. I wanted to thank you for all the presenter today is a wonderful and very uh, practical implemented information. And uh, both group presented very well, specifically focusing on barriers. And I wanted to comment that there are barriers that can control or that can address by the providers, but it's still there are answered barriers that are either patient issue or other external that has, we have little control on it. So I wanted to think about it also, how we can extend our uh, support to intervene those barriers that are still unreachable by the providers. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Islam. Well, I'm gonna wrap us up real quick here and then hand it back over to Dr. Desai in a minute because I don't want us to run over. Uh, but again, I wanna express my appreciation to all the presenters and to everyone uh, on the team who put this together for today. But if we kind of wrap it up with the key question, the key question to me is, is it clear to all of us participating that evidence-based interventions improve success rate with colorectal cancer screening? And I think the answer is yes. I think we heard from Dr. Richardson that multiple layers also improve success, uh, particularly those who go from no uh, interventions to four. 
Now, with that said, I think all of us have to realize that we can't always do everything that we want. So the key challenge for all of us as we transition out of the session today is what is the one thing that we can do next in our site across our organization, uh, whether you're with one community health center or just one clinic, what is the one thing we can do next to tackle this problem and get us, uh, get us moving more uh, closer to that 80% thing? And with that, uh, I'm going to turn over to Dr. Desai to wrap us up. Um, so uh, I think let's go to the slide with the um, CME. There we go. So um, you guys can scan this for all of our uh, providers that want to take advantage of the CME credits. Um, scan this uh, using your QR code. We'll also be emailing out a link, and there's a link in the, um, the chat as well. Um, the one reminder with this link is that you have to register for a, if you haven't done this before, you have to register for a username using your email address first, and then you can go in and claim your um, CME um, credit. Um, if you've already registered before, you can use the same username. Um, so uh, closing announcements, um, thank you, Dr. Patton, for leading us through these presentations. Thank you, Dr. Hott, um, Ashley, and Rhonda for your presentations, as well as Dr. Uh, Lisa Richardson, who, who uh, was joining us from the CDC. Um, we all offered um, great presentations and very useful information for us, um, as we all have the shared goal of increasing colorectal cancer screening rates um, in our clinics. Um, and uh, just one quick announcement is that for next presentation or, or next echo session is gonna be on July 6th. We're gonna need a um, presenter for the case presentation as well. So if you are interested in that, please reach out to me um, or you can um, email the, um, the email address right here, aucrcscreening at augusta.edu. Um, I'll also be reaching out to providers um, requesting um, additional case presentations. We've had an all great presenta um, presenters so far, so we wanna continue that. Um, and that is it. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Richardson. Thank you. Great job. Dr. Hot, stick around for a little bit after. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Echo team, uh, stay on the call, please. Oh, one, two, six, one, six. Kush, your hand is still raised. Can you take that out, oh, please? Sorry. Yep. <laughs> uh, I know you don't have a question. <laughs> no, no. Okay. Dr. Islam, you went back to being Claudia again. Well, oh, yeah. uh, it didn't allow me to change the background <laughs> because it's not me. I think she. I think she left something in the in the software so that we would never forget her. So. Yeah, but it, it is my limitations that I couldn't change the background. But I have my own. When I log uh, log in with my own name, it has yeah. a background. <clears throat> I have a uh, promotions and professionalism committee meeting that started one minute ago, so I'm going to have to jump off pretty quick here and join that one. So. That'd be great. Uh, no problem. We can 